So we are going to continue from where we stopped last week. Last week, if we remember, we discussed developing research papers from machine learning experiments, the practical guides. So we discussed last week the abstract, how to write a very good abstract, where I mentioned that uh, you need to make sure you answer the question, what you want to do, why, from two point of view, the importance, the why it is important, and also why from the gap analysis. Sometimes a particular research idea might be very important to the community, but then someone already, someone did it already and got it published. So why you still need to continue when the problem is already solved? So you need to establish the gap as a support to the importance that you have answering why. And of course, you also tell us the how, how you want to solve the problem. And the how also we divided into two, so how you want to solve the problem by telling us the method you're going to use and also tell us the why of how. Why are you choosing that particular solution? There are other solutions that could be possible. So why are you choosing this? Because these are some, we mentioned that these are some of the things that comes to the mind of reviewers. Once you mention the method you are proposing, the next question that comes to the mind of reviewer is, okay, but why this method? Why not other methods? That's why we don't leave our reviewers in limbo. So we quickly answer those questions before it actually pop up in the mind of reviewer because that goes a long way to get them satisfied. And of course, we're gonna give the summary of the result outcome and then the, impl the implication of such uh, results. And if it is in a proposal, we at least tell us the envisage or the expected result that we're expecting. So after that also, we move to introduction where we mentioned that introduction is just a, an elaborate abstract. That is where you are going to write we are going to answer basically the three questions of what you want to do, why you are doing it, and how you are doing it. But this time around with detail, with a lot of detail to support your points. Because in abstract, you cannot have citation in abstract, but in introduction, you are actually encouraged to have as many citations as possible. Actually, the more the better, because that's we show the your graphs of the area, how much you have really gone into the literature to really read about that area and that you are fully aware of it. So when you answer the question, what you want to do, support it with quotation, according to the word it organization, according to the meaning. I mean, whenever you mention points that cannot come from your own personal understanding, like you are making quotation to a statistic, number of people that are suffering from a particular disease, you cannot claim that is from your own side, otherwise it's not going to be, it's not going to be acceptable. So you need to tell us the source of such information and so many other ways you can make your writing very interesting. When you answer the question why also, tell us the importance, then tell us the importance the, 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 from the important side and also from the gap. So what I've seen as a very common mistake is for people to just start writing without mentioning that earlier work, although earlier work has been done in this area, they just move into, in this world we are, we are proposing this. You are proposing just on the go without reference to if it has been done before, what is the state of the art, why is, because the state of the art will justify if there's need for your own contribution or otherwise. So this is very, very important that people need to pay attention to. So we discussed that also in detail last week and also the why. So in introduction, you make it more detailed. And also we also reminded ourselves of the need for us to have a kind of, uh, and the indirect uh, table of content, which is this last paragraph, that the remaining part of the work is organized as follow. So after you have summarized your result, tell us how you organize your work. Usually reviewers do like this kind of idea. Since papers don't come with, uh, with uh, people don't come with a table of content. So this is a, a kind of an indirect way of letting people know how you have organized your work. Although it's not compulsory, but from my own little experience, it's very necessary. So then we also discussed the concept of review of literary literature. So we also described description of the proposed techniques where I mentioned the need for us to have a mathematician or people who can play with equations on how you can be describing those machine learning techniques. Even if you are not adding, you are not modifying anything in the machine learning algorithm, at least you still need to present some little technical detail of how you are relating that algorithm to your present work. 
And I give example last week from another paper that I, I displayed for us to see. It. So it's usually recommended to have at least two techniques when you are dealing with machine learning experiment, at least two techniques minimum, so it can be more. So ex ex except in situation whereby there's a very recent paper that you just want to quickly develop a new single application or new model that can compare with this latest one, that is fine. But in most cases, if you are working, maybe you are the first one to work in this area, or if you are not even the first one, it's always good to have at least two methods because like we always say, let the data speak. Sometimes you are not even sure the method that is going to work for you until you actually uh, carry out the experiment. So we need to pay attention to these points also. And then we move to the empirical studies, which is actually when we talk of machine learning experiment, this is where it actually starts now. Now, so the empirical studies, uh, in starting with the description of the data set, this is why you have to talk about the data set you want to use. Tell us clearly where you got the data set from, give us the link. This is very, very important so because in empirical, in empirical studies, it's one of the conditions is that your, your experiment must be reproducible. That is somebody must be able to stay outside your own zone and also carry out the experiment you have done correctly and achieve your results. Otherwise, your, your paper is bound to be rejected or to be, people can be suspicious about your paper. So, and if we don't know where you got the data, so how are we going to be able to repeat your experiment? So this is why it's very important. Give detail that we make people to be able to locate the data set you have used. And if it is a confidential data from industry, then let them know this particular fact, but still you have to provide some basic information about this data, because I had to clarify that there are a couple of situations whereby uh, a particular company might insist that the data set should not be made available due to some competitors and the like. It should be declared appropriately, but then still the basic information about the data will have to be provided in order to de demonstrate to the, to the editors and the reviewers that, yeah, an experiment has indeed been carried out. So things to be provided include the statistical analysis of the data, which we demonstrated last week, and I told you how to do it. Simple Excel file will do this for us. Finding the correlation between each attribute and target attribute. So sometimes you might even want to show the skewness of your data, how is the data distributed? Is it normal distribution or whatever? There are so many other visualization also that you might want to show people how the data set is actually looking at, looking like. Now, so having done that, we now move to experimental setup. This was where we stopped last week. So, and I mentioned to us that uh, experimental setup is very, very important. So, like I was saying, so experimental setup, uh, just like any other part, but experimental setup is very, very important. Some people call it description of the experiment. So we have to make it as clear as possible because uh, this is actually the part that would determine whether your paper can be, your result can be reproduced, can be reproduced by another researcher or not. And the moment some of this information are missing, definitely it's going to be very hard for any, for any, um, for any reviewer or editor to consider such paper for possible uh, publication. So we have to be at this one in mind very much. When we talk of experimental setup, what are the requirements? So I said here, you describe how you carry out your experiments. For example, you, you need to mention the experiment was carried out using whatever platform, Python, Weka, R, make it very clear. Also, you mention how you partition your data. This is very, very important. See, if I don't know how you've partitioned your data, how am I going to repeat your experiment? I've seen a couple of people omitting this. Actually, it's outright rejection because if you cannot tell us, if you don't tell us how you partition your data, it means no one can do, can carry out that experiment. So for example, you need to mention, okay, we use both direct partition and also the tenfold. So this one, direct partition is also known as the old out method where you divide the data can divide your data into 70% training and then 30% testing as the case may be. 
or you use the tenfold crop validation. We already discussed this concept in our earlier videos. So we need to make it very clear which one you have used. Sometimes people use one for the optimization. Why they use the final model? They use the holdout method for the final model. They have to make everything clear so that someone will be able to pick up your paper and reproduce what you have done and get the same result. Otherwise, there's a problem with that experiment. Now, I mentioned something here, especially if someone published earlier than you, it is very important to use the same partition method as the previous research that you wish to compare your work with. See, you just find out someone published in an area that's very interesting to you. So when they have used 70% training, 30% testing. Then when you're going to write your own, you need to use the same, part, the same petition. Otherwise, there will not be a basis for you to compare your work with their work. Someone developed the model using 7030, and then you develop your own using 10-fold crop validation. It's okay, but then you cannot claim you are comparing your work with this guy because what you have done is different. So that is why, in addition to using others, when you are going to compare your work, you have to make sure the experiment is the same as the one you want to compare with. Just like we, we know that you cannot be comparing, maybe like people say, you cannot compare apple with an orange. They are both fruit. Yeah. But then, so these are both method of partitioning. Any of them is okay. But if someone has decided to use one and public that paper, then you that you are now trying to do your experiment, then you compare your work also with them. To make your work valid for comparison, you need to use it. However, let me clarify something here. If I see that someone use 70% and 30%, I might decide to do the two. I might decide to have a section that will use 70% and 30%. I have another section that will use 10-fold crop validation if I have justification for that. But when I'm going to compare my work with its own, I have to mention that, okay, we are going to compare the one with 70% in our experiment so that it's going to be unique. So we have to be just when we are doing comparison. Because what is happening in 70% training, 30% training is totally different from what is happening in Stanford crop validation. Totally different idea. So you cannot compare the result from, from different partition scheme. So we pay attention to that. Now, I said a state other description that will make it possible for other people to repeat your experiment. You see, this is very important for research outcome. Just sit down and see is there anything if you don't tell us in ditch your experimental setup that someone cannot carry it out without talking to you you see a common mistake here is for people to start describing how to use weaker it starts you have to download weaker you have to install it no you don't need to describe this is not what we call experimental setup if you want to use neural network you have to click the weaker no we don't need all these things anybody can go online and search for how to use weaker so whatever people can get online or from another person aside you, you don't need to waste your time telling us here. But there are some very simple assumptions that you made that if you don't tell us this assumption here, no one will know what you have done. Those things become very, very important. In fact, they are compulsory for you. The moment a reviewer or editor find out that such things are missing, then that paper stands to be rejected. So that's why we have to pay attention to this. So your data set, maybe your data set was not clean. You did some pre-processing. You have to mention, okay, I did this. Your data set will have a missing value. You have to tell us how you treated those missing values. You don't just jump to results. And people who try to use your original data, they couldn't get the result. They have to contact you, threatening that we're going to withdraw your paper. You now say, no, when I did the experiment, it was not good. I have to use uh, pre-processing. But you need to mention it in your, in your paper. You see, whatever you did while carried out your experiment, that no one will know about it except you, you have to compulsorily, you have to make it available in the experimental setup or description of experiment uh, part of your work. So I can say it's a big determinant and it's very, very important. And I've seen a lot of people, uh, several people have been rejected on, on account of this. The reviewer will just say that the experiment is too cannot be reproduced. So a lot of details are missing. So we have to pay attention to that. So it said, describe how you set up the experiment and you use your methods and the parameters used. So you have to tell us how your parameters were set. We're still going to go to optimization. Let's say for you, let's say you use KNRS neighbor 
our common uh, algorithm. You need to tell us what is the number of K that you use. Is K set to two or set to three? You have to tell us. So everything must be made very clear because if you use three and then you didn't put it in your, in your paper, how are we going to be able to reproduce your work? We start making guess, maybe you use three or five or seven. No, it's not allowed. You have to tell us what you have used. Now, so of course the method used is very important. They make this section very clear so that it will be very easy for anyone to just read this section and easily repeat your experiment. This is just the caveat. Everybody pay attention. Make your experimental setup very clear to the point that anyone reading this section should be able to carry out your experiment. Yeah. So having something to make the experimental procedure very clear is very nice, especially in the form of flowcharts. If you can draw flowchart or flow diagram or framework presenting the proposed model, that would be very, very, uh, that would be very, very great actually, because that will go a long way to make it easy for people to see and understand the flow of your experiment, which is very important. Now, which is very important. Now, as I was saying, if you can present your experimental framework in this kind of flow charts, it could be, you can be very innovative in this sense. So whatever this step you have taken, try to make it very clear. You can see this as an example, start, data gathering and preparation, data pre-processing, model building. Tell us whatever you have done. So once we, because the ad advantage of this kind of figure is make it very easier for people to follow figure than following the, uh, the paragraph writings. But of course, this is not a replacement for that. So you have to put that one, this is compulsory, writing it like this, okay, but then supporting it, this one is, is optional. It's optional because some people also might find it difficult to interpret what you have drawn here. If they are not technical guy, the moment they just see flowchart, they want to run away. So for those people, they will read what you have done here, which is fine, this is for everybody. But here is for people who, who like technical stuff. To me, it's very easy to, to get, but some people don't know how to interpret it. For example, this main model building, I, when I build the model, I test the model, then I move further to check if there's need for me to refine the parameters. If yes, go back here. So if no, then continue down. Build the final model, model validation, prediction using the model, result analysis and interpretation, identification of hotspots, and then the end of the stops. So this really breaks down your work into very clear steps. Data preparation stage, this is learning from data stage, and this is the stage where we carry out prediction and interpreting the results. So, or better, you can modify this, just you can modify this a general standard, so you can modify it to suit the area you are working with and the procedure that you are, you are using. It's an example of one, you see this data collection, this is hyperparameter optimization. This is machine learning simulation, predict, predicted labels, performance satisfactory. If yes, then do the risk assessment model. If no, then go back again. So do hyperparameter optimization. See, this is a kind of, an, this is an example of how you can make your experiment very clear to people. So telling us, okay, I'm using ANN, AN. And we are also <clears throat> you're telling us the, the parameter you are optimizing, the learning rate, the momentum, the network topology, the transfer function. These are the parameters being optimized for ANN. Well, you mentioned hyperparameter optimization for support vector machine, the cost function, the C, the kernel, and other parameters. So, so it can be, I'm showing this one, it can, be, it can vary from one application to the other, depending on the problem you are solving. So be very innovative in how you represent your experimental description in the form of flow chart, flow diagram, or framework as the case may be. Now, so <clears throat> once you are done making your experiment very clear, so the next very important thing you have to also tell us is uh, what we call the performance mayor. Before we move to that, you see this optimization strategy is very important. We're going to mention it later. Because uh, when you train any model, yeah, when you train the model, need to refine the model. That the popular example we used to give, let's say we use KNRS neighbor, uh, our simple friend, 
I like it as an example because it's very simple to grasp. It's like, show me your friend, I tell you the kind of person you are. So we want to see K nearest neighbor. What is the value of K? Value of K, if I'm trying to predict if somebody's diabetes or not. So our K can be, if it is only two, two, two class problem, our K could be one, it could be three, it could be five, it could be seven. So we need to see which value is going to work for our data. Like we know in machine learning, this principle is always there. Let the data speak. Let the data speak. So even though you read in, this, in literature, a lot of people making suggestions that are usually the best value of K nearest neighbor are usually between seven and 11. These are all recommendations. To me, let your data speak. Because sometimes you might have data set that you'll be surprised that you'll be getting the best one from three as against the advice that you read somewhere. You see, because this is the issue with machine learning and data analytics. So now let's say when I start, usually you start from one. So you try to see, okay, when I run the experiment, I found out that I'm getting just 85% accuracy. I still want more. So can I go back again? That's why I need to refine the model. Yes, parameter tuning. So parameter tuning is I'm going to change the value of key now. It was one, I'll change it to three now. Then run it experiment again, build the model, test the model, check the result. Are you okay with the result? Not yet. So you keep going in this kind of looping until you are satisfied. So what you are doing indirectly is not is what we call optimization. You see, you are doing a small optimize, a simple optimization of parameters. See, you are trying to look for the parameter that's going to work for your data set. Because the same method, you use it on two different data set. If the data set might come from the same establishment, will you be surprised the parameter will be different because the data set have some characteristics within them that you don't even understand and they are different. So, so we are going to discuss optimization of the parameter. It's another very important thing that is good for you to include under your experimental description. Now, so next we are going to see the performance measure. So we discussed the performance measure. Here you need to tell us what, is the, what are the performance measures that you want to use. Performance measure, they are the, the choice of your performance, of measuring the performance. You see, what are the choice that you want to use to measure the performance of your algorithm? So for example, if you are working on classification problem, as an example, you had to try to predict if somebody is diabetes or not. So we'll be talking of something like accuracy. That is how many are correctly classified and how many are wrongly classified. So that is going to be in percentage. So you'll be talking about uh, precision. So we're talking about recall and also of others. Because most importantly also we'll be talking about the, what we call the confusion matrix, the confusion matrix. We already discussed, there was a chapter already we discussed about performance measures, so we can check some of our archives for the videos on performance measure. So confusion matrix that will tell us how many are predicted, like false positive, false positive and false negative situation I will usually explain to us. So during the analysis of your result, you are going to need the performance measures value because without the performance measure, and you have to use performance measure that have been used in earlier work. This is very important. But there are so many performance measures, and sometimes it varies. The choices will vary from one area of application to the other. So you have to pay attention to what has been used in earlier world. So that one will guide you on how and when you are going to use and the correct one to be used. Now, if you are talking of a regression problem, regression problem is a, when you are trying to predict actual value, like I want to predict the score of a student, score. It's going to get 80.5 in the max, or I want to predict the age of someone, age estimation for forensic investigation. So where people's age can be predicted by measuring the length of their fingers and the width of their wrist. And so few parameters from the body measurement could be used to estimate the age of people. This is known as a regression problem. In that case, we'll be talking of root mean scale error. We'll be talking of... Uh, um, yeah, root mean scale error. <clears throat> we'll be talking of the hard scale, the correlation coefficient, and host of others. And we'll be talking of plotting the predicted against the 
the estimated, the predict value against the original value. So uh, these are the original given values. This is my model. I want to see how close my model is to the actual value given. So these are things we are going to use when we're talking of performance measures for regression application. So depending on the problem you are solving, so you have to include the performance measures. And it's not something you have to come up with, you have to check the literature. So in that area, what are the performance measures that are usually acceptable or agreed upon? For example, software engineering prediction has some very specialized prediction, predict, predictive performance measure that we have to use. So if you are the only one, the first one to work in that area of application, maybe in your field, no one has ever tried to use machine learning, then you be the pace setter by trying to come up with what are the performance measures that will be appropriate to this particular problem area. Of course, you may need to con con consult experts in machine learning too that you can sit down together and be able to decide what he or she feels is the most appropriate way to go. Now, so having discussed performance measure, now we now look at the optimization strategy. You see, this optimization strategy, I mentioned in under the parameter, uh, under, under the description of experiment. See, when you're describing your experiment, I told you sometimes we might have to be changing the value of the parameter, like K. So how do we change it? This is very, very, this is very, very important. Very, very important. Now, now optimization strategy. <clears throat> the optimization strategy here is for you to describe for us how you search for the parameter that enables you to achieve the best possible performance. See, this is very, very important. So how are you able to achieve the best result that you are reporting? So you need to tell us how you have done, how you have done that. So I've seen people just they are silent on this. Some people don't even tell you the values. See, every system you have, every method, every machine learning algorithm you have implemented, you must list out the performance measure that, sorry, the, the, the parameter values that you finally use. Yeah. So this is going to, <clears throat> Here you must present the plots as you search for the parameters, showing how the performance accuracy changes with the parameters, and then finally provide the final best parameters in the table that follows. So you have to give the summary of the parameter in a table like this. For example, this is for support vector machine. So the C is one, the upper parameter lambda is 0.01, the epsilon is given to be 0 0.02, 0 0.2, sorry, Y kernel is 0 0.3. So these are the values you have chosen, not just at random after carrying out the optimization strategy. However, some people might want to say, how did you just get this value? How do you get this value? See, including this value is compulsory. That is what you need to do, it's compulsory. You don't include this value because there's no way I can repeat your support vector machine experiment without knowing this value that you have used. These are the final values. However, beyond just telling us this final value, sometimes, you see reviewers that are also interested in seeing how did you arrive at these values of these parameters? How? Did you just select it at random? You just make a guess? Definitely nobody does that. So, and like I said, you might read in the, you might read in the, in the research, they say the best value, the optimal value for C is between 500 and uh, 700, for example, it doesn't follow. This is just an advice based on their own experience. Always remember that you need to let the data speak. So your data will speak for you and will tell, tell us what is the best parameter to be used in each case. So in addition to telling us this, so what else can you do? And that is you can make a plot appropriately so that to tell you the detail of what has been done. Now, let's say we're going to pick our friend as an example. Yeah, like uh, this, is, this, is for, this is for support vector machine. This is for the K, our K nearest neighbor. The value of K, the best one in this example I'm given is 21. I got the best K at 21, but how did they arrive at this 21? So sometimes it's very necessary to give them. Now let's start from 
that of a support vector machine. When you are dealing with support vector machine, the best parameter, the, sorry, the most important parameter is actually what we call the kernel, uh, the kernel, the kernel, the, 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 the kernel function. So we want to see the kernel function that is going to be used. So in this case, you have to do this very, what I call the simple optimization strategy. So we have like four parameters that are parameter value for the kernel. See? So you can see here, we are saying this is a, this is the upper parameter search value for kernel function. There are five, four, four values, four, para, four value for this parameter. We have the polynomial kernel, we have normalized polynomial kernel, we have the PUK, and then we have the RBF. So in the experiment, you can see, this is the accuracy. This is the accuracy of the results in percentage. So this one gives us this. We don't know which one is going to be the best. So we check this one again. This one gives us this. So, so you make up a small plot here. Yeah? Usually while you are running the experiment one by one, you can put it in Excel so that we can see at a glance that this is the same, this polynomial kernel is doing the best for us. So in my next experiment, I'm, to, I'm going to keep polynomial kernel as my best value for this parameter kernel function. So kernel function, I'm going to be using poly kernel. So all my subsequent experiment, I'm going to be using this best parameter value that has been established because I tried to check for other available values. They couldn't beat this particular value. So this is one very simple systematic way of searching for the optimal parameters. Now, once you have done that, you move to other parameter. For example, this is cost function C. You can see here also, we keep trying different values. One, five, you can try at random. So we discuss, it's going to be a video later on uh, how to optimize parameter. There are several ways of optimizing parameter. You might have to, have to do some other algorithm, like genetic algorithms and some other optimization, PSO, particle swarm optimization, and B colony optimization, and so many other optimization algorithms have been developed. But this simple one is what I usually introduce to the newcomers. So you are still learning machine learning. You don't want to bother yourself with those other idea of optimization algorithm. But this simple one, anyone can, can do it. Just log in, get your weaker, put your data in. First start by putting the value, put the value C, C is got to one, and run the experiment, see? put six, go to one, run the experiment, put five, you can jump value, put six, you can jump value, put 11. Oh, you found out that it's going up, put 25. So you can see, after 25, you can see that there is no more change. Keep running, check 10,000, check 20,000, 20, nothing changes again. That means that improvement kept coming. Sometimes you might be surprised that it's possible to have this kind of scenario whereby after some attempts, you can see that this one might also come down. So you just stop. The moment you see it start coming down, then you stop. It means there is an improvement until you get to 25. It means my C is going to be 25. So the optimal value for C is going to be 25. We should, that's what the value I'm going to be using for my experiment. This is a simple way for new comma or starters in this area to optimize parameter without using third party algorithms, which we have the opportunity of discussing them later on. Now, so with this simple thing, you can always get the best parameter for your algorithm. Now, so this is another example, this epsilon, the same way you can see as we are changing the value, we're monitoring the percentage accuracy we are getting, you put it in an Excel and you can, you can actually see it goes up, go down, and then finally, you can see it start going down. You try to reduce it further or increase it further, it keep going down. Then you can stop. Then you at the end of that, you'll be able to identify which of them gave me the best result. Seems the best result was gotten starting from this point to this point. So we can see someone at random here. So that's going to be your optimal value for the epsilon. And the same thing goes for other parameters that you may want to check, like our friend KNRS neighbor. So if you want to check KRS, KNRS neighbor for the yeah. So for example, for KNRS neighbor, I'm going to make my plot very clear. So when K was one, I got this. When K become three, I got this one. K became five, I got 
keep increasing. When K became seven, it comes down. I put nine, even comes it came down more. So you plot the curve, you can see here that the optimal value of K, that with this K, K is got to five, I can get the best result for my model when I'm using K, K nearest uh, neighbor. This is the simple optimization procedure that is always good for you to indicate in your report. It actually enhances the, uh, what we call the uh, integrity of your work. Because uh, unfortunately, uh, we have to clarify this point. Sometimes you see people that will not pay attention to, they just assume, they, they don't do some experiment clearly. They just assume, they just give some assumed value for the optimal values. And when you try to run the experiment, you won't get what they claim to have gotten. You see, this is really uh, very unfortunate, but then sometimes you have such cases. So, however, this is why, why you see some, uh, some reviewers, whenever they have to write a paper, they give, when they want to read a paper, they pay attention to this kind of thing. They want to see how did you arrive at this value that you just put in table for us. Did you just assume these values? at random or you really did something experimentally and this is why personally i do scurry people if you can put this kind of plots that will really give more kind of uh, openness and then yeah openness to the work we have done and make it very clear that we are not just making assumption about c we actually carried out experiment to determine the value of c the value of accuracy at each value of c and then the plot can can speak for itself actually so this from my own experience actually increases the integrity of the experiment that have been carried out. So that is an experimental description and then the optimization of the parameter, how you make sure that you are using the best parameter for your system as much as possible. So having done this, that is the, I can say the most important aspect of the experimental setup has been discussed. The next is we're going to look into result and discussion result and discussion this is also very very important and that very important because sometimes you might have very promising results but i've seen people they don't know how to present their result a result presentation of machine learning experiment is not it's not just a direct rewriting of what is in the table some people just put the result in the table and that is all and then they write some paragraph to see that from table one you can see that ann is better than svm and that is all I mean, there are some very important things you need to present in your research discussion. What are the implications of such of, 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 of such research we have gotten, and how? Why is why do you think this kind kind of research is it? Sometimes you see very highly respected method is not performing on your data. How do you justify? How do you convince the reader that yes, your your result your result should be given a place at least for the meantime until someone is able to prove that there is another method that can perform better than that. So your result and discussion will also go a long way to showcase the effort we have put into the experiment and the entire paper. So this is where we're going to stop for the day. So to give room for any question, if there is any. So by the grace of God Almighty, we are going to continue from next week, next week from research and discussion, a couple of options that you might have to add to your experiment also, like feature selection and also host of other considerations that could enhance the presentation and outcome of your machine learning research experiment. So thank you very much for the time and I wish us all the best. Barakallahu feekum.